Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask you to stand and I'll read our call to worship. And today it comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 10 and 11. It's titled, The Lord is Our Shepherd. Hear now the word of God. Behold, the, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him. We will tend his flock like a shepherd. We will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we approach him. Our, our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our, the right to uh, worship freely. And Lord, we look at this day as a day set aside to honor you, to worship you, to hear God's call to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to prepare our hearts and our minds, our thoughts, the pressures of the week, that you would put them aside, Lord, that we would leave those upon you and cast them so that we might be able to hear you more clearly through the preaching of your word this day. Be with us now, Lord, as we raise our voices to you with praise. And we ask this now all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Our first uh, hymn is uh, number 53, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Number 53 in your bulletin.
Please be seated. At this time, we'll go again before the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord, we, we marvel at the things we don't understand. We're humbled by your work in our lives. How you've called us from a life of sin and a wasting away to a life of peace, a life of new life in Christ, the hope for today, the hope for tomorrow, and the hope and joy of eternal life with you. Lord, we, we think of our country, Lord, and we think of the divisions and the fighting amongst ourselves. And we're reminded to work with one another, to be at peace, to be an example of Christ in our daily walk and in the world today. And Lord, we would pray that you would call those in authority over us, local, state, federal. You call men and women to, to you that they might live their lives as we strive to in glorifying you in our walk. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for our unity. We pray for peace. Lord, you have given us peace in our hearts when you called us to yourself. But now in the midst of many months of the flu, the virus, and the the constant concern, it's always on our minds. Lord, we just would pray that you would take these from us, that we would just rest in your arms, knowing and assured by your word and that even the counsel of others to put our trust in you and to patiently wait. Lord, use us this week with the people that were around, either at work <clears throat> or house, loved ones, fellowship, Thanksgiving meal, that we would give praise to you, Lord, for we are a thankful people, and you are God. Lord, too, we would also ask that you would bless the tithes and the offerings this morning to, your, to you and to your good here and abroad for the work of our church, for our local missions and our world missions. Lord, we pray that the gifts that we give would be to you and to your glory. We ask this all now in Christ's precious name. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bible to 1 Timothy, uh, Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 7. Um, this morning we are opening up the floor for nominations uh, for the office of elder and deacon. In Acts chapter 6, the apostles tell the congregation, um, you choose men who meet these qualifications and, and we will appoint them into leadership. Okay. You, you choose and, and then as long as they meet the qualifications, we'll appoint them into leadership. Um, notice the apostles don't say to the congregation, pick whoever you want, whoever you pick, they'll be your leaders. They, they don't say that because then the election could become a popularity contest. You could vote for someone because he's handsome or good looking or just a nice guy or a friend of the family or hey, he's willing to do the job or whatever. And so the, the apostles don't say, well, just pick whoever you want and, and whoever you pick, they'll be your leaders. But the apostles also don't say, look, we're the apostles. We're the leaders. We know what's best. You sit tight and we'll decide who your new, new leaders are going to be. They could have done that. They were apostles, but they don't do that. Instead, they say, you choose, and as long as they meet qualifications, we'll appoint them in a leadership so that the congregation works with the current leadership to appoint new or additional leadership. Okay, you, the congregation, works with us, the current leadership, to appoint new or additional leadership. So, uh, our job this morning, and beginning this morning anyway, is to uh, remind you of the biblical qualifications for the office of elder and deacon, and then your job will be to prayerfully look around 
and uh, think about all the members of the church family and consider whether there might be men in the church that meet these qualifications that God might be raising up as an elder or deacon. And if so, to, to nominate uh, those men uh, for the office of elder and deacon. All you gotta do is turn in a piece of paper that says, I nominate so-and-so for the office of elder, or I nominate so-and-so for the office of deacon. It doesn't have to be typed, doesn't have to be calligraphy, doesn't have to be a nice stationery, it can be a scrap of paper, but just turn it into writing and nominating that man for office. And if you nominate someone, a, a, a man who's a member of the church, we'll meet with him just to make sure he meets biblical qualifications. And as long as he does, we'll bring him back to you and we'll have an election and we'll have you, an opportunity for you as the congregation to vote and, uh, and, and elect him. And if you do, uh, then we'll uh, ordain him and put him into office. So that, so that the congregation, you the congregation, works with us, current leadership, to appoint new and additional leadership. And that's what we hope will happen. It's in the Lord's hands, but um, we're hoping that as you prayerfully think about the, the men in the congregation, uh, that you'll see men that you think might have these gifts, and if so, that you'll nominate them, and uh, we're hoping we'll be able to bring some before you at some point in the future for election. So that's our, our prayer. Uh, but we need to start by looking at the, at the qualifications for, for elder and deacon. Now, uh, next time, Lord willing, we'll talk about the office of deacon. This morning, we're going to consider together the office of elder or overseer. So uh, our passage this morning is from 1 Timothy. We're picking up where we left off last time. Uh, we're now in chapter 3, uh, beginning with verse 1. Uh, let's hear God's word. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now, thus far then, the reading of God's word. Well, let's begin with prayer, let's pray. Lord in heaven, we're thankful that your word speaks to um, all areas of our life, including church life, and including this important matter of the office of elder or overseer. We pray, Lord, for wisdom. We pray you'd bless this word to us. You'd guide us and instruct us. You'd shepherd us and encourage us. Uh, and we pray, Lord, if it's your will, that you'd be pleased to raise up men uh, to serve us uh, in this way in the future. Lord, we ask your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've been talking about godliness, and we've seen so far that godliness is an outward-facing life that reflects and spreads the love of God in Jesus Christ. Okay? Godliness is an outward-facing life that reflects and spreads uh, the love of God in Jesus Christ. Okay, To be godly literally means to be, to be like God, to be loving, caring, and compassionate like God. And we've seen that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God cares about the world. He, he cares about the lost. He cares about people out there. He doesn't just care about himself. He doesn't just care about us. He cares about other people. He cares about the fallen, the broken. He cares about sinful. God cares about the world. And so if we're going to be godly, if we're going to be loving, caring, and compassionate like God, then we have to have an outward-facing life. We have to care about other people. We can't just care about ourselves and our family or our church family, but we've got to care about others. So godliness is an outward-facing life that reflects and spreads the love of God in Jesus Christ. Now, last time we were talking about women in worship and what it means for women in worship to be godly. And we saw that, uh, that Paul doesn't allow uh, women to have spiritual authority over men in the church. That's chapter two, verse 12. He says, I don't permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. He doesn't allow women to be the, the, uh, the leaders of the church. Well, if not, then who will be the leaders, who will have the authority over the men of the church. And that brings us this morning to the office of, of elder or overseer. And the first thing we want to see then is that the role of elder or overseer is a noble task. Okay, look with me at our text, beginning with verse 1. Paul says, the saying is trustworthy. Now remember, Paul's going to give us five of these so-called trustworthy sayings, five of these pithy sayings that you can kind of build your life on, that you can you can hang your hat on. The entire Bible is trustworthy. Every word is true and perfect like God is. But the Bible's a big book, and so it can be helpful to have 
certain little pithy sayings that you could hold on to and, and you can hang on to. And um, we've already seen one uh, back in chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You can believe that. You can, you can bank on it. Uh, no person is too sinful to be saved. If you are sinful, then you qualify uh, for salvation. You don't have to get your life in order in order to be saved. You don't have to get your household in order in order to be forgiven. Jesus came for people like us. He came to save sinners. Paul says that's a trustworthy saying. That's his first trustworthy saying. Well, uh, this morning, uh, we come to the second trustworthy saying. He says, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, normally we use the word elder. When we're speaking of leaders in the church, we use the word elder, but sometimes elders are referred to as overseers. In Acts chapter 20, Paul calls the, uh, the elders of the church in Ephesus, which actually is this church. He calls the elders of the church in Ephesus, and he tells them to care for the flock over which God has made you overseers. So he's talking to the elders, and he says God has made you overseers. So elders are sometimes called overseers. Um, Peter, for example, 1 Peter 5, speaking to the elders, says he wants you to exercise oversight over the congregation. The elders exercise oversight. And then in Titus, uh, Paul says, Titus, I want you to stay in Crete and appoint elders. And here are the qualifications for elders. Only that's not what he says. He says, I want you to stay in Crete and appoint elders. And here are the qualifications of overseers. So he uses the words interchangeably. An elder is an overseer. An overseer is an elder. The word elder... Uh, is the word uh, presbyteros uh, from the Greek and where we get the word Presbyterian, okay? A Presbyterian church is governed by elders. Um, the pastor is not the head of the church. The pastor doesn't run the church, okay? Jesus is the head of the church and under Jesus, each congregation should have a, a session or a body of elders. In the Old Testament, okay, there was one man, David, for example, as king over all God's people, but each individual city had what they called a session of elders. The elders would sit in the gates and rule that, that city. One king who ruled over all God's people and underneath him, each city had its session of elders. In the New Testament, we have one king, the Lord Jesus, the son of David, and under him, each congregation to be led by uh, a session of elders. The word elder, by the way, emphasizes the dignity of the office and, and the maturity. He's to be an elder. Well, the word Overseer, which we have in our passage here, comes from the, the Greek episkopos. Okay, we get the word episcopalian. Um, it, it literally means to oversee. Scopo is to scope out something. Epi is over. So if the word elder emphasizes the dignity of the office and the maturity necessary, well, then the term overseer emphasizes the role or the task. The elder is to oversee the congregation, to watch over the church. But the point is, an elder is an overseer, an overseer is an elder. And what we see this morning is the role of elder or overseer is a noble task. Remember back in chapter 1, there were some men who wanted to be elders. They wanted to be teachers of the law. They wanted to be overseers. Paul said no. But the problem was not that they shouldn't want it. The problem was that they weren't qualified. But it's not wrong to want to be an elder. It's not wrong to aspire to that. He says if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. It is something that, that young men should aspire to. It's a good goal. Every man should at least aspire to be the kind of man that Paul is going to describe. Not everybody's called to be an elder or a deacon. Okay, we all have different gifts. And uh, much time in life is wasted trying to be something you're not. You'll never be a good imitation of somebody else. Uh, much of the Christian life is learning to be yourself and accepting who you are and your gifts and be the best you that you can be. You're not going to be a good version of somebody else, but you can be the best you that you can be. Uh, so not every man is called to be an elder or a deacon, but every man should aspire to be the kind of man Paul's going to describe. Because most of what he's going to describe are character qualities that every man should have. So if you're a young man, if you're a young boy, or if you have a young man in your family, if you have a son or a grandson or a nephew, Okay. These are the kind of qualities he should aspire to. These are the kind of qualities you should try to instill in him. And incidentally, um, if a man is going to be nominated for elder or deacon, to some degree he should aspire to it. 
That is, before you nominate a guy, make sure he's willing to serve if he's elected. Now, he may be like Timothy. Timothy had some reservations. Remember, Timothy wasn't sure he was the man to stay there in Ephesus. A man may have some reservations. That's fine. But if he absolutely says, I refuse to serve, then there's no point in nominating. So before you nominate someone to the elders, do speak to him first and confirm that he's willing to serve uh, if he's elected. Now, we've just seen, okay, that Jesus came in the world to save sinners. That you don't have to get your life in order to come to Christ. You don't have to get your household in order to, to become a Christian or, or to be saved. We should anticipate that people come into the church with issues and troubles and, and problems and backgrounds and, and areas where they need to grow and change. And, and that's fine. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. This morning we're talking about elders. Okay? The standard for salvation is very low because Jesus came to save sinners. Okay? But this morning we're talking about the office of elder and the standard is high. Paul says that's a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. Okay? Reproach is correction. You take a man aside and say, look, you can't talk that way. You shouldn't use that kind of language. You can't treat your wife that way. Okay? And it should be anticipated when people first come to know Christ. They're going to need reproach. There are going to be areas where they need to grow, where they need to change, where they need to be challenged. But by the time a man is being considered for the office of elder, he should be beyond that. He needs to be above reproach. He can't have an obvious problem with his character or lifestyle. He won't be perfect, none of us are, but he can't have an obvious problem with his character or lifestyle, and he can't be a womanizer. Paul says, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. And I don't think that means that an elder has to be married. Paul wasn't married, Jesus wasn't married. Um, but most men in that day were married. Uh, just as most men today, at least in the church, are married. And if he's going to be married, he needs to be faithful. He needs to be a one-woman man. He needs to be um, faithful to his vows. He can't be a womanizer. Um, imagine a man's an elder. He's been an elder for 20 years, and then his wife passes away. Is he allowed to remarry? We, 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 well, we would say yes, certainly. I mean, the Apostle Paul says if, you, if your spouse passes away, you can remarry in the Lord. But believe it or not, uh, the early church wrestled with that question in the third and fourth century because they said, well, he's already been married once. If he gets married again, that's two wives. He's supposed to be the husband of one wife. Well, Paul means one wife at a time, okay? So that rules out polygamy. In some cultures, men have multiple wives at the same time. Polygamy is ruled out. But the idea is he's got to be a faithful man. He can't be a womanizer. What if the man's been divorced? Some people would say, well, if he's been divorced, automatically he's disqualified. But actually, you know, Paul and Jesus say there are some circumstances in which a divorce is necessary or biblical. Um, so it would depend in that case. Um, but if a man leaves his wife and takes up with another woman, obviously then he's automatically disqualified. Uh, he can't be a womanizer. Sober-minded and self-controlled. We know what it means to be sober. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But an elder has to be sober-minded, which means he has to be able to think clearly. Okay, a mature Christian may feel things very deeply. There may be times when you just feel things very deeply. Okay, emotions are not bad, but an elder can't be controlled by his emotions. Okay, he's got to be able to think clearly and do what's best for the congregation and not just act out of anger or fear or frustration. He can't be controlled by his emotions. He's got to be sober-minded, not somber-minded, by the way. Somber is, you know, sort of morbid. Uh, not somber-minded, but sober-minded and self-controlled. If an elder can't control himself, if he doesn't have himself under control, if he can't lead himself and govern himself, then he's not qualified to lead and govern somebody else. So first he has to demonstrate control over himself before he's qualified to lead anybody else. Paul also says an elder must be respectable. That is, he's worthy of respect. Uh, he can't be such a, a goofball that nobody can take him seriously, or he can't be so foolish that nobody could look up to him. He has to be respectable and he has to be hospitable. In some circles, it's thought that being an elder just means you go to a meeting once a month. Of course, there's so much more to it than that. To, to be hospitable is to open up your life and your home to other people. And in particular, in the, in the first century, that meant toward Christians from other congregations. Remember that travel was so difficult in, in the ancient world and uh, inns, places to stay overnight were few and far between and such as they were tended to be disreputable and unclean. 
And so when, when missionaries and evangelists were traveling through town, it was especially important that the, the elder of the local church, the elders would open up their homes and, and, and provide hospitality for these traveling missionaries or evangelists or even just a Christian couple that happens to be traveling on the road uh, for some reason. Some Christians only care about themselves, their family, and their church. But it's important for an elder to have a broader view that he accepts, encourages, and welcomes uh, Christians from other congregations, shows them hospitality, and sends them on their way. So he must be respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. It would be ideal if every uh, elder was a brilliant communicator and engaging and exciting, uh, but I don't think the emphasis here is really on his communication uh, style, um, but rather on the content. When, when Paul uh, gives this similar list to Titus, he says an elder must be able to exhort in sound doctrine. Exhort doesn't mean preach, but to encourage or to urge. And so the emphasis is not so much on his style of communication, but the content. It's got to be sound. Remember the guys in chapter 1 who, uh, who wanted to be teachers and they weren't allowed? It wasn't because they weren't good dynamic communicators. It was because Paul says they don't know what they're talking about. Right? And so it's important that an elder is committed to what we call the historic biblical Christian uh, faith. You don't have to have a lot of knowledge to become a Christian. In fact, you can be saved and have all kinds of pet ideas and, and theories, and that's fine. And you can become a member of the church and have all kinds of unusual ideas. In fact, since Paul's day, the Christian church has gone in many different directions. There are many different Christian traditions, and all are welcome. But if he's to be a, a leader of the church, if he's to teach and be an elder, then it's important that he's committed to the historic uh, biblical faith as contained in our historic uh, confessions and catechisms, creeds of the church. He's got to be solid. Paul told Timothy he's got to be able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Now, some elders are better one-on-one. -on -one. Some elders are ideal at working with young men one-on-one. -on -one. Some are better with leading small group and discussion. Some are good at, at lecturing, okay? But again, the emphasis is not so much on his uh, communication skills or style as it is uh, the content of what he's communicating, uh, that he can exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. He can't be a drunkard. Uh, you'd like to think that doesn't even... I have to be mentioned that it goes without saying, but the truth is, as much as the opioid crisis has been in the news, and we've seen it all, um, I, one time I well, I, well, we've seen it all. I won't go into detail. As much as we've seen it all, probably the thing that we've seen um, more consistently over the 25 years I've been here in South Jersey uh, has been alcohol. The, the functioning alcoholic, the guy who, who seems to be a nice guy and family man and everything, um, but at home uh, drinks and drinks and doesn't know when to stop. In fact, Paul says he must not linger over wine. He doesn't say he has to be a teetotaler. In fact, later on, Paul's going to tell Timothy, drink some wine. It's good for your stomach. Uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, in this culture, they drink wine with their meals, but also sometimes the, the water wasn't necessarily clean. And so uh, it's not forbidden to ever drink wine, but he has to know when to stop. Uh, every alcoholic says that he can stop whenever he wants, but not every alcoholic wants to stop. And, and so um, an elder must be a man who knows when to stop and is, is able to stop. He can't, he can't linger over wine. He can't be a drunkard. And he can't be violent or quarrelsome. In fact, Paul says not violent, but gentle. It's not enough to say, well, I haven't hit anybody lately. Um, more than that, he has to be gentle. Uh, in our call to worship uh, this morning, uh, we read from Isaiah that the Lord is like a shepherd who, who carries the little lambs. When a shepherd is leading his flock, the, the little newborns have trouble keeping up. Well, a good shepherd isn't going to be cruel and thoughtless or harsh, but the good shepherd goes and he, and he carries that lamb in his bosom. And sometimes an elder has to be like that. Sometimes the elder is dealing with, with those who are grieving, those who are weak, those who are sick, those who are troubled. And it's important not only that he's not violent, but that he is gentle. Okay? So he can't be violent or quarrelsome. Well, I already mentioned that sometimes an elder has to be able to refute people who contradict uh, the teachings of the Bible. In fact, uh, 
Paul told Timothy, stay in Ephesus and, and, and tell those know-it-alls to stop teaching that nonsense. So sometimes you do have to challenge people and what they believe and what they're teaching. But you don't want to be quarrelsome. That is, it's important to know uh, when to stop, when to stop talking, uh, when to stop arguing. Uh, some guys are attracted to the office of elder because they like the idea of talking. They like the idea of debating. And, and um, well, an elder can't be quarrelsome. And we're gonna actually going to see that these men who wanted to be teachers of the law, we're going to see as we get into this book, that was the problem, is they tended to just cause controversies and quarrels uh, in the congregation. An elder can't be a drunkard violent, quarrelsome, or greedy. Uh, Paul says he must not be a lover of money. We're going to get into that as well when we get to chapter 6 when Paul talks about those who desire to get rich get themselves in all kinds of troubles. Some people are insistent that it's not wrong to be rich. It isn't wrong to be rich. It's not a sin to be rich. Job was rich. Abraham was rich. But those who want to be rich, that's what their heart is set on, get themselves in all kinds of trouble. Uh, if a man is going into the office of elder for what he can get out of it, he shouldn't even get into it. An elder, a man should go into the office of elder with what he can give, not what he can get. He's got to be a giver, uh, not a taker. So he can't be greedy. And he must manage his household well. Verse 4, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, uh, keeping his children submissive. It doesn't say that he has to keep his wife and kids under his thumb. That's specifically forbidden. In 1 Peter 5, uh, Peter says elders are not to lord it over the congregation. That is, you don't go around prancing and showing off your authority and saying, this is my church, I'm in charge, or this is my house. He's not to lord it over anybody, but he does need to demonstrate that he's able to, to lead people. And, and that brings us to our second point. If, if the, the first point is the role of an elder or overseer is a noble task, the second point is that an elder must be a shepherd leader. We've already seen that, that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Right? That's the first trustworthy statement, that Jesus came in the world to save sinners, that Jesus came in the world like a shepherd to seek and to save the lost. Well, if being godly is being loving, caring, and compassionate like God, then an elder must be a shepherd leader. He must love the way God does. An elder must be able to work with and manage imperfect people. Uh, some elders are, are very, or men at least, are very sharp theologically, but they can't deal with children. They're impatient. They can't deal with the, 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 the imperfections. Children are, are young. They haven't finished growing yet, and some men just can't deal with that. But Paul says, uh, an elder's got to be able to manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Because if someone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? In other words, if he can't handle his own kids, if he can't handle his own family, if he can't work with people, then how can he lead the congregation? Uh, interestingly, it doesn't say uh, all his children have to be born again. Uh, we don't have control of that. We don't have a button that we can press to make our children born again. If we did, we would all press it. But he simply says that when your children are your children and they're in your house under your care, you need to be able to manage them. You need to be able to lead them. Once they grow up and go out of your household, you have no control of how they live, but you need to be able to lead them while they're in your household. Okay, so you gotta be able to work with people. An elder doesn't just come to meetings. He's got to be able to work with and manage imperfect people like you and me. Um, next, he can't be a recent convert. Um, he says he must not be a recent convert, a neophyte, a recent planting. Imagine a guy comes to the Lord. He's saved. He's converted. Six months later, uh, they make him an elder. Well, the temptation is he might become arrogant. He starts to think, of, well, look at me. I've risen to the top in just six months. Paul says he may become puffed up with conceit. And the idea there is that his thinking may become clouded. He gets, gets exaggerated thoughts of himself. And, and that wouldn't be good for him. Paul says he must not be a recent convert. Or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Well, the devil is the accuser. I mean, that's what the book of Job calls him. So he could simply say that if a, if a man is ordained too soon, uh, well, he becomes arrogant, and so Satan is going to condemn him. Satan is going to accuse him. That could be what he means. But if you remember where we left off, Paul was talking about creation and how God created Adam to be head of the human race, and he created Eve to be Adam's helper, and the two of them were to rule uh, together or have dominion over the creatures. And yet when Satan came to them, Satan 
did not come directly to Adam and he didn't come in the form of, a, of an angel, but instead Satan took on the form of a, of a serpent, a lowly animal, which is not what you would expect. And he came not to Adam, but he came to Eve. So that by tempting Eve, uh, Satan undermines the whole order of creation. So that here's Eve, a woman, a human being, being led astray by, by a creature, by a serpent. And then here's Adam, the man, the head of the human race, being led by his own wife. So that Satan undermined the whole order of creation. And so then we saw last time, God then comes to the serpent and says, because of this, there's to be enmity between you and the woman and your seed and her seed. And her seed's gonna crush your, uh, your head and you'll strike his heel. And that could be what Paul is referring to here. The condemnation of the devil might refer to the condemnation that the devil has received. Okay? Satan is guilty of pride. He's been, he's been condemned because of his pride. A, a glorious angel who in pride has fallen from heaven. And, and what does Satan do? He tempted, he tempted Eve. Eat this fruit, you'll be like God. God has now condemned Satan because of his pride. And so maybe what Paul is saying is, don't make a new Christian an elder right away because he may make the same mistake that Satan did. He may become puffed up and then be condemned for his pride. In other words, when a man's nominated, the answer is not necessarily yes or no. It could be not yet. Uh, there are some men in our congregation that I think um, are, are ready to serve right away, and I'm, I'm hoping that might happen. But I also think there's some, a number of young men in our congregation that have great gifts, but they just need time to grow, and there's nothing wrong with that. So if someone's nominated, it's not just a matter of yes or no. It could be just not yet. Uh, give a guy some time. Paul will later say, Timothy, don't lay your hands on a man too quickly. Well, he's talking about ordination. And he simply said, don't be impatient. Give a man a chance to grow. Well, the elder can't be a recent convert. He must also be well thought of by unbelievers. So far, Paul's been talking about us, the church, what we think of a man. And now he says it's also important that he be well thought of by outsiders, that is, people outside the church, uh, because sometimes people in the world see things we don't. Sometimes you can have a man who's, who just seems like a wonderful guy on Sundays, but maybe during the week, people see another side of him. Maybe he's unscrupulous in his business practices. He's, he's unreliable. He doesn't keep his word. He's, he's dishonest. And that's a problem because his lifestyle is going to reflect on the church. And I've known situations where people outside the church have said, if that man's going to be a leader in your church, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. I don't want anything to do with you guys because that, uh, an elder's lifestyle is going to reflect on the church. So... An elder has to be well thought of by unbelievers, by outsiders, so he may not fall into disgrace. Uh, it's interesting that he just talked about being puffed up, the danger of being puffed up like Satan, and now the danger of, of falling into disgrace. They sound like opposites, being puffed up or being falling down. But of course the two go together. Um, Satan is happy with either one. He's happy for you to be puffed up and arrogant. He's just as happy for you to fall into shame and scandal. Okay, but the two often go together. You know, pride goeth before fall, and when we become puffed up and overly confident, that's often when we then fall into shame. Uh, notice he says, the elder must, not be, must be well thought of by outsiders so he may not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. And the idea is that, you know, Satan wants to snare all of us, but especially those in leadership. I mean, especially when someone in leadership in the church, when he stumbles, that's, that's that much more scandal, that's that much more disgrace or, or shame. And so the idea seems to be that when a man becomes a leader in the church, he gets a, he gets a target on his back, that he's under special uh, temptation. I think the main point, though, is that a man, before he can shepherd the congregation, first has to demonstrate that he himself has been and is being shepherded. You know, before a man can govern and lead and teach and, and discipline the congregation, I think he first has to demonstrate that he himself has been uh, disciplined and taught and led and instructed uh, by, by the shepherd. Now remember that, that Peter, in 1 Peter 5, when he's talking to the elders, calls them under shepherds and that Jesus is the chief shepherd. Jesus is the chief shepherd. You know, Jesus came to, to, to seek and to save the lost. He came to save sinners. And, and yet the goal of the Christian life is not just to be forgiven. It's not just to be saved. It's not just to get to heaven. Once we become a Christian, we want to grow. 
We want, to, we, want to, we want to follow Jesus Christ. And so it's important that we submit ourselves to the shepherding of Jesus Christ, that we allow ourselves to be taught and corrected and disciplined and fed and nurtured and cared for and, and led. And, and we need that. We need, sometimes we need Jesus to, to carry us, as it were. A man is not qualified to shepherd other people till he has first demonstrated that he himself is being and has been a shepherd himself. And that's what we all need. We need our Lord Jesus to lead us, to correct us, to care for us, to, to carry us, to feed us and nurture us and to, and to shepherd us. And in fact, our closing hymn uh, this morning is, He leadeth me, O blessed thought. I mean, that's the, the wonderful blessing of being a Christian is that Christ is now our shepherd and he leads us. But one way he does that, one way he leads us is by raising up elders, overseers, under shepherds, uh, through whom he shepherds us. So that's our prayer as we conclude this morning, if it's God's will, that he might raise up elders uh, from our congregation to help, uh, help lead us uh, forward in the future. Let's pray together. Lord in heaven, uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We were all sinful, broken, fallen, and, and we need Jesus. We need his saving grace, his mercy, his pardon, his forgiveness. We also need his tender loving care. We need him to carry us, lead us, correct us, discipline us, guide us, feed us, nurture us, care for us. We need him to shepherd us, Lord. We need that individually. We need it for our families and we need it for the church family. We pray, Lord, that you would do that very thing, that you would shepherd and guide uh, us as your, as your people. We, we belong to you. This is your church, your congregation. We pray, Lord, that you would shepherd us well. And if it's your will, Lord, that you would raise up under shepherds, elders, overseers, uh, through whom you might uh, shepherd our congregation. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask now if you would to take out your uh, bulletin and uh, turn with me to hymn number 600. And we'll sing together, He leadeth me, O blessed thought. Let's stand and we'll sing together, He leadeth me, O blessed thought.
Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.